Welcome back everyone. I'm going to work on transcutaneous monitoring right now. A very brief um, PowerPoint that highlights the main things that you need to know for your credentialing exams. Now I'm going to say this, um, those of us in the adult world or that focus mainly on adults, we don't see this this often and so it's, it's a little bit unfamiliar for transcutaneous monitoring. So we have a lot of questions and so that's how I've taken this this PowerPoint. Um, each slide is a question and the answers to it. And within the answers, you should have everything you need for your credentialing exam that they may ask you. So let's get started. So transcutaneous monitoring, what is it? So trans means through cutaneous, the skin. So there is a sensor that's placed on the skin that provides continuous information about oxygenation. So pressure of oxygen, TC means transcutaneous, and ventilation, okay? So you can have pressure CO2 that's transcutaneous. So here's the deal, only works on infants because the infant's skin is thin enough for the gases to diffuse from the tissues into the sensor. Okay, so that's the first thing. We don't use this, uh, this type of monitoring on adults because our skin is too thick. All right, so here's also the thing. We like to do this transcutaneously. It's better than sticking the baby, okay? Nobody wants to stick an infant. That sounds really mean, right? But here's another reason we don't want to stick them um, other than we just don't like the thought of it. The arteries are really small. It's hard to stick for a gas. Also, every time, whether you stick or not, let's say they have a UAC in place, you worry about diagnostic blood loss. You know, they only have a little bit of blood and if you keep pulling it out to do lab tests, they may suffer from hypovolemia. So having transcutaneous monitoring eliminates that. So, um, but the thing you have to remember is this measurement may not reflect arterial blood gas tensions. Like it doesn't equal the PaO2 and the PaCO2 because what it's measuring in the underlying tissue. But as long as the infant is hemodynamically stable, there is a correlation between the two. All right, so I've just told you this only works if the baby's hemodynamically stable, and that's something to remember. All right, how does it work? Well, in that sensor, there is a heating element. When you stick it on the baby's skin, it heats up the tissue or the skin so that that underlying tissue, there's vasodilation that happens. And when that vasodilation in the tissues happen, the oxygen and CO2 diffuse out of the capillary beds of the tissue into the sensor more readily, okay? So this has to be heated. All right, how do you apply it? So you select a highly vascular area, okay? Because we gotta have that vasodilation. So highly vascular areas, earlobe, upper chest, that's a good commonplace, abdomen, thigh, or lower back. You don't wanna put this on any bony areas like the spine. If you put it on the right upper chest, that's gonna be significant because you're talking about preductal oxygenation there. And if you put it on the left upper chest or the lower body, that's post-ductal. So these two things are important to remember if you're trying to diagnose a patent ductus arteriosus. That is covered in the congenital heart defect lecture. All right, so you also, remember it heats, right? That temperature needs to be set 41 to 44. And here's where you're gonna have to use a grain of salt. Different references say different things as far as this temperature. This was taken out of Walsh's Neonatal and Pediatric book, okay? So 42 to 44 degrees Celsius. Anything colder than that, we're not gonna get good vasodilation. Anything hotter than that caused the potential to burn, okay? So you gotta heat it up, you gotta find a highly vascularized area, then you're gonna use a drop of sterile water or electrode gel between the electrode and the skin. And what this does is it makes a good tight seal between that sensor and the skin um, that'll make diffusion more efficient 
and it eliminates any air bubbles. We don't want any air bubbles in there. We only want to measure the gases contained in the tissues, not gases in an air bubble. Now, this electrode, because it's hot, is moved at least every four hours. Okay, got to move it so that it doesn't, all that heat doesn't cause burns. Now, here's what you have to remember. The more premature the baby, the thinner the skin. So you may need to move this more than every four hours. You're gonna to have to monitor the site for redness. And if they're really red after four hours, that's your indication that you need to move the sensor more often. However, one thing to remember is when you move the sensor, you have to recalibrate it with each move. All right, so how do you calibrate? All right, you're gonna number one, calibrate it on initial setup when you're first using it and when changing the probe position. Here's what you do. You take it off the baby, you hold it up to room air, and you hit a calibration button. That's, it's that simple. Here's what goes on in the machine. The machine takes whatever the barometric pressure is, it subtracts water vapor pressure, and it takes it times 21% as a decimal format. If this is a, if this is a, a PO2 electrode, which is what they're gonna ask you on your board exams. When you do this, this comes out roughly to around like 148, 150-ish around there, okay? And so, assuming barometric pressure is 760. So, as long as it's reading that, you know it's calibrated, and then you can put it back onto the baby. Now, when you put it back on the baby, it takes 20 to 30 minutes to equilibrate before it's actually reading right, and you have to remember that too. You gotta give it a little bit of time to, to work right. Now, I will tell you with this, this is an important number to remember, 148, 150, because if you have a transcutaneous oxygen monitor on your baby and it's reading close to 150, but your pulse ox is reading 90, there is a discrepancy there, right? And a lot of times these turn loose from the skin and when that probe turns loose from the skin, it's exposed to room air. And what the probe is then reading is a pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. So pay attention to that. That's like something they like to ask sometimes. All right, so that's how to calibrate it. And then there are limitations to it. It's good to know the li limitations. It's labor intensive. Um, you have to prepare the sensor. You have to prepare the site and there's uh, site changes, I guess, and membrane changes. A lot of times if this doesn't come into calibration, often it's because the, there's something wrong with the membrane, okay? Uh, you gotta calibrate it with every move, so you gotta take care of it, right? You have to not only move it, but you have to calibrate it. And then you have to remember changes in perfusion of that tissue will affect the reading. So when you have decreased perfusion, you have lower values, okay? So something to remember. Remember, it only works great when we have an infant that's hemodynamically stable, okay? Hope this has helped. See you soon.